People die from extreme cold and extreme heat. The Australian Health and Welfare Institute published their data on climate deaths and it looked at people who died from floods, bushfires and from heat. And heat was still far ahead of all other visible threats. Things are just going to get more frequent, more prolonged heat waves, more frequent pandemics. So why, why would that be? I mean, I thought COVID was a one-off. If you look at the way Australia's deforested, these are the lungs of the earth. Trees draw down carbon. If you lose trees, you lose the insects that live in that tree, the organisms that live in the soil, and all the animals that live in that tree carry bacteria and viruses. So when we disrupt nature, there are going to be more diseases. Present by Your Energy Answers. Hello, guys. Uh, welcome again to uh, Your Energy Answers podcast. Today, we've got with us uh, Dr. Kim Liu. Welcome to the podcast, Kim. Oh, thank you so much for being the f also inviting me being the first doctor on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think there'll be a few firsts because in 2007, not many people looked at their houses and thought, oh, I can make that a bit more energy efficient. So... What got you into that? Well, you know what? It started quite a while ago because I grew up with parents who really, without necessarily knowing they're drawing down on energy, um, kept reminding me to turn off, the, turn off the lights, make sure you actually watch how much energy you use with electricity for the lighting, have shorter showers, they grew their own food. And so you end up being I'm kind of like my parents. So when I bought the house, I kind of looked at the house mm. and thought, you know, and I was glad of the way the house was orientated and I looked at ways of making the house more energy efficient because that's what I was brought up to do. But, you know, when you first buy a house, you don't have much money. Mm. So the, the ease – and I'm a gardener as well and I knew that I wanted to have a food forest in the backyard and a native forest in the front yard. So that was my vision to start off with. But but you're in suburbia. Yeah. We don't have food forests in you don't, suburbia. But you can create it if you are determined enough. So it was gradual. It was really gradual. I added to the trees and um, on both sides, in the back and front yard. And so the trees actually reduce the heat in the on the western wall of the house. Mm. Um, and the front of the house, which is facing east. Actually, it was also hot, but I've got – it's completely shaded with native forest trees now. And but so – I'll stop you there mm. now. A lot of people think, oh, well, I've got a tree in my house nearby. It'll block the gutters. It um, – you know, I've got to clean it up. Yeah. I think there are even Asian beliefs that there are yeah. spirits living in the trees. Yeah. So – how do you uh, kind of get yeah. other people to think like that? Well, you just don't plant trees that lose their leaves near gutters. You make sure you don't have deep-rooted trees in a house so it's up, up ending concrete. Mm. You kind of have to do your research about that too. So, so you need rainforest trees with shallow roots, yeah, that kind of thing? Yeah, and like… Lily pillies? Yeah, I've got lily pillies right along the back mm. um, because it's also a good boundary tree. It gives mm. you more privacy. Mm. Mm. So… I, and and because I couldn't afford every, all the trees at the same time, it was really gradually adding. Mm. And so the other thing I looked at was that a lot of the water I was using was um, in the garden. So I also had installed a water tank on the western wall, so it's cooled down the family room. So it's a 4,000-litre water tank. And I, I needed my gutters done at the same time. That's mm. why I kind of did it at the same time. So that in itself made the house cooler by just having a large water tank in, on the other side of the wall of the hottest room. So it's kind of like a big mass that yeah. is naturally cool yes. and then that cools, cools the, the – so if the if actually the the sun shines onto that wall, yeah. it heats the water the, first before – That's right. Yeah, okay, okay. So that made a big difference. Mm, and mm. I, you know, I was lucky there were already pink bats in the roof, so I, the roof was really insulated. So it was – all those things actually reduce my power bill initially. Um, to and your water bill from And my water bill as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so gradually what I did also was I um, changed all the halogen downlights. For, oh. uh, for I had 50 halogen downlights, which is crazy. Very trendy in the 80s. Ah, but the heat it, ca it causes and the energy it uses – so what, the next thing I did was actually change all the 50 halogen downlights to LED lights and that cut my power bill again. 
And I actually installed those LED lights back in 2015 and they're still there. And by next year, those, halo, uh, those LED lights have been there for 10 years and they're still working. Yeah, I, look, it's this in, is um, interesting because in the early days of LED, the ones that they built, and they were quite expensive, they have a life of over twenty to 25,000 hours. Mm. So they built them very solid because they put a lot of cooling elements in it. Mm. Well, I happen to know this because I've worked in lighting mm. for a while. Mm. But now the new models, they deliberately designed them that they only have up to 5,000 hours. So you're going to chuck them yeah. and all those raw materials mm. go in the bin, even so we have the technology make them last five times longer. Just uh, just a little aside I here. I know. It's terrible things are built for obsolescence. Mm. Mm. I think the government should basically, the right to repair and those kind of things, I mean, we're going sideways here, mm. but those are actually very important because if you buy something and it's already designed to be dead in make mm. it four, five, six years, the raw materials that are being wasted, the transport to get it to you, the time it takes to install it, the time you now need somebody else mm. to come again and to install it again, that's all money into your pocket and also raw materials out of, out of mm. the world. So. Um, they, they sh the politicians got to actually think, no, we got to think of products that last not five years, but 10, 15, 20, and even 25. Oh, uh, yep. And this is a bigger conversation because we need to actually have a, uh, a sort of manufacturers own their product. And there has been examples of this around the world where I think Michelin mm. actually takes their tires back mm. to recycle. So they've got a sort of circular economy. So the, the people who have consumers buy the tyres, but in the end, it goes back to the manufacturer. Mm. And we have a circular economy, even with, you know, our mobile phones. Uh, the trouble is a lot of um, devices have the, have every single thing stuck in it rather than, um, so it's really hard to disassemble to use the raw materials. And there's so many precious metals that could be more easily recycled if things weren't stuck together in our iPhones, our pads, our tablets, our computers. Mm, mm. Um, so it's, it's a whole systems thing where we actually need to see that we have so many elements above the ground if we could effectively cycle so that manufacturers take their own products back to re repurpose, reuse, remanufacture, it'd be a great thing. I think if we look fast forward here 40, 50 years now, the fact that people were able to import thousands of washing machines, thousands of TVs, mm. and then afterwards just wipe their hands and it becomes the waste streams problem. That's right. You're never going to solve it. But if you put, I'll, I'll make it up now, but $150 bond onto that washing machine and that goes back to the consumer when that washing machine has reached end of life, but it has to be paid for back by the manufacturer and the manufacturer has to recycle it. That would mean that the manufacturer has an incentive in the first place to design it in a way that makes recycling easy. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, theoretically, we could sit here all day and solve the problems in mm, the world, was... but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, politicians usually only get really into action when there's something in it for them, which is votes. So it's actually got to be demanded by the mm. end consumer in the first place. And a lot of people are so busy now with cost of living pressures and all that. Um, a lot of the energy efficient appliances and the things they can do, they do cost more. And if you're already pressed for yep. money, yep. you can't actually afford doing yeah. the right thing. So, you know, it's it does take steps to do. Like with all my white goods, each time one died, so I never actually replace anything till it dies, I look at the um, star rating for energy and then I buy the best thing I can afford at the time. Mm. And uh, so gradually I've replaced every appliance, uh, this is since 2007, every single appliance in my kitchen, and I've still got an old kitchen, um, so that now I have energy efficient fridge, uh, washing machine and, um, and my cooktop. And, um, so it is, does take time because you think about it, you can't do everything at once because it's just way too expensive. But you're a doctor, you should be able to afford everything. Yes, but you know, it's still, I've got kids and it's just, I'm just lucky I'm in a place where I, I can afford it, but then I'm in a place where I can advocate for people who can't afford it because right. we need systems in place where it's fair um, because the energy transition will clean the air and the water and um, and make us more independent with our energy. But 
if you just allow the markets to take place, people who are privileged like me can afford it. But then you have other people who are paying more for energy and it's the deep inequity of it if we don't actually make the whole system fairer. Well, I always say with solar rebates, for example, it's mm. very uh, unfair. It's yep. middle class welfare, some mm. people say, because you really only get benefit from the solar rebate if you own a house in the first place. Mm. But the solar rebate is recovered on putting a bit extra on the electricity bill. So all the renters who can get not access to mm. solar because not many landlords are mm. interested – are actually indirectly paying for the people who already get a house to get a cheaper solar system. So yep. that's been designed by politicians. Yeah. What are they going to do to make solar okay. easier for renters? So if you look at there is, um, if you look at Darabin Council, which is council in Victoria, they've actually put um, done the bulk buy for people who are living in sort of in energy poverty, mm. so that it is the that with the bulk buy. Um, you can actually make solar panels cheaper, and the council did that. So there are much richer councils who, who as in that's not a very rich council, but they still managed to do that because they wanted to s help uh, people who are poorer have energy. Look, so, uh, I, I'm going to knock this back and I sound like mm, the cranky danky, mm. but I have been tendering for bulk buys. Yeah, yep. And we've put the long-lasting, slightly more expensive mm -hmm. gear too, which would have given the overall benefit mm -hmm. long-term. And inevitably, on the three or four I've been involved in, the mm. council picked the cheapest crap mm. that in five years' time we were going to know was because mm. they were totally ignorant. They thought okay. solar panels are all the same, inverters yep. are all the same. So when you do do a bulk buy, have a real expert attached to it yep. so you do not buy the crap that yep. actually gives you more headaches. So like there are now experts who can advise on so many things and I – I have a little bit more faith in councils than you do, I think. <laughs> I worked for them for 13 years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, it's like we, we know what needs to be done. We know what's available. Mm. Uh, we know that we need better legislation so that there is – because at the moment, because um, I have worked with another organisation called Better Homes for Renters and they're advocating for better energy efficiency uh, for rental homes – um, there are examples overseas where the rental, the energy efficiency of the rental is actually advertised with the rental home. And so, and like if we can have energy efficiency for houses, like so each house, I know we've got poor housing stock within New South Wales, but if each house can be rated regarding the energy efficiency, that will be part of the value of the house. So we need systems in place that looks at that. And um, because we now know that energy efficient houses actually save us money. Very true. Because so, when energy was very cheap, it didn't matter. But mm. right now in Europe, my mum mm -hmm. paid eleven thousand dollars last year just to heat the house. Eleven thousand mm. dollars. And in Germany, they now have what's called an energy star rating system, mm -hmm. where the house is assessed. And when the house is sold, there could be two houses mm. in the street looking very similar from mm. the outside, but one will sell $100,000 more mm. because it's got a top rating mm -hmm. with double and triple glazing versus mm. the other one. Mm. We need to get something like that in Australia. Yep. So when you buy it, you actually know your liability for the energy. Is that what you're talking oh, about? Oh, absolutely. Because to make things more transparent, because, mm. you know, things are so many things are opaque. Where, um, you know, like even, uh, and you know what, people aren't, haven't got the energy literacy in terms of understanding power bills mm. and understanding, um, although there's lots of smart meters, so people aren't understanding which products are drawing the most energy. Look, it's happening slowly, but it needs to be happening more quickly because part of the education will mean that people are going to understand what they're advocating for. Does that make sense? No, it's, it is. It is. But look, I, I walk through Bunnings mm -hmm. and I see all those big radiator heaters which throw two and a half mm. thousand are totally inefficient, yep. but it's $19.90. Yep. So somebody walks in in a cold winter's day, wants to heat the house. They didn't realise they're just buying a bomb that's ticking away mm -hmm. and killing their electricity bill mm. because there's no education and no and information attached to it. Yeah. Look, I love it if the energy rating for an appliance, like the, the bar heater or the mm. radio, mm. Um, the, uh, the radiant heater, heaters are actually on the device. Because we know now that 
Um, what I've got at home that I had installed three years ago was my um, air conditioner heat pump, mm. um, which we now know is the most energy efficient way to actually heat and cool a house. Because the bulk of money most people spend on the house is heating and cooling it. But the, but most people would go, I get my bill, it's bloody enormous, but I have no idea where it all went. Mm. Did it go into the showers with my teenage daughters? Mm. Was it the TV? Was it the heating? So how do people get to know that info? Yeah, look, you can actually um, you can actually get a smart meter from your energy company mm. so that you can actually look at, you can turn each device on at a time and can see how effective the devices are the device is. They're little meters that you can put between the PowerPoint and your actual appliance to mm. see how much energy it's drawing. So there's multiple ways um, you can do it. Some councils actually loan those devices out. So you can actually have a look at the energy efficiency of each device. Um, I've got my reposit um, uh, app, mm. uh, which you have too, Marcus, haven't you? Uh, I'm looking at it. I haven't. I, I've played with it, but uh, I'm, I'm. I haven't got a battery at house, so yeah. it's coming. So, so with that, I can actually see when each device is turned on, mm. and how much um, uh, the background energy is being used. Mm, mm. Yeah. But but look, I'm with with busy families. Yeah. You've just proposed another job for them, running around doing all that. I mean, yeah. let's just inform people in a general way. Your yeah. biggest. Electricity use is normally your heating, yep. then maybe your hot water. If your hot water is very inefficient, mm. it could even be your hot water initially. If you it, it if you be. have a huge 400 litre tank, mm. just normally yeah. without a timer on, on yeah. electricity could be huge. Yeah. So that's the heating and the hot water, after which you would look at the appliances like the washing machine and the dishwasher yep. potentially. Yeah. If you've got an aquarium, that's an energy sucker. That's a vampire for energy. <laughs> Don't have an aquarium at home, Marcus. <laughs> but those, I mean, they're very popular, but yeah. please be yeah. prepared to pay for it. The same with pool filters and pool pumps. Yeah. They suck quite a bit of energy. Yeah. Again, older models, yeah. both aircon and all that is mm. obviously much more than new. So so is, that, is that about the right? It's about the right thing. But when you look at how do you keep people healthy, people die from extreme cold and extreme heat. Mm -hmm. That's why it's sort of like heating and cooling the house is really an important thing. So you're saying from a doctor's point, point of view, view um, having the right living environment. Oh, yeah. You have to be comfortable in your own home. Mm -hmm. Mm. But some people can't afford to actually run the aircon and they just yep. suffer in silence yeah, so, in the heat. So we know that there are, because quite a bit of research going on into this now. Mm. And so we know that fans are also effective. Um, we know there are ways, because you, you know, Australian st standards mean there's three mil windows on, in houses. And it, windows are just not. You mean three millimeter glass? Uh, glass windows, mm. yeah. So when you have, that's what that my, my house is like had heaps of three mil glass. So you lose and lose a lot of energy, heat and cold through that glass because it's just not efficient. And so there are ways to actually improve the um, efficiency of your glass. There are things you can stick on your glass because um, I've double glazed, but it took me a long time and I didn't do all the windows at once because it was expensive. But in between, I put blinds and you can stick things on windows to make them more energy efficient. You can um, put... At external blinds. I mean, so, three so, so what you're talking about, and I think I've done that at my house, yeah. is there's like a, you know, like you used to do the solar guard tinting on the mm -hmm. cars and stuff to get mm -hmm. privacy. Yep. So you can get the tinting put on, which yep. I actually believe is not that expensive. It's probably two, three hundred bucks per window. Yep. And that can get off up to 50, 60% of that's the right. heat doesn't go through yeah. the window anymore. Is that, that's is right. that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Mm. I've actually even had patients put bubble wrap on because that's all they could afford. Mm. So, I mean, making your house sealed so you don't lose um, the heat and cold, even though snakes are useful, mm. um, making sure that um, that you have fans because fans actually help with cooling as well. What uh, about thick curtains? Thick curtains can help as well. So mm. whatever can shade the radiant heat. Mm. and th Like if you keep uh, all the blinds down and uh, seal your house, you can keep your house cool. Okay, if if the house has no other thermal efficient features, mm, mm. but you know it's everything else. Whether you have tree canopy, whether you have a dark roof that actually absorbs heat as well. So it's looking at the whole house and how to make it safe during very hot 
and very cold days. But from a design point of view, for example, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we've gone backwards. Our roofs weren't black. Mm. Um, now they're black. That's worse. Uh, we used to have awnings. Yeah. Um, Federation houses, a lot of them have only awnings over the windows. We now often have not even a gable. It's just all straight. I, I visited a friend in an apartment mm. block on yeah. level 22 in Parramatta. Yeah. It was so hot on a normal day because they had this huge big window facing west late in the afternoon. There's nothing that they could do other than maybe big blinds. Yeah, so it's really re-looking really at the building codes. Um, and there's two building codes. There's the basics, which are the legislated minimal standards mm. in New South Wales and there's also the National Building Code, which is now been upgraded. But still, they are still, because the, the basics codes were just um, last October, they're still assuming that the house is air conditioning for thermal efficiency. And that's really suboptimal. And the building codes are still looking at past data rather than future pro climate predictions. Because when you want to build houses, you want to build houses that are going to be there for the next 40 years, that keeping people safe. I'd say even longer than 40, quite Oh, frankly. 40 or more years. Mm. So that because we know it's going to get hotter, but the building codes aren't up to scratch for that. And so there is a lot of advocacy in that area looking at the building codes. But the builders will push back because they want to build it as cheap as possible and then make the biggest profit. And so that's why there's <laughs> – it is. And, you know, it is – so that's why we've got the um, Greater, uh, Greater Sydney Heat Task Force, which is, and also there's groups like Western Sydney Regional Organisation of Councils that look at the gaps in the building codes. They've got a cool tools um, for builders. Um, they've been advocating with large builders like Mervac and Lindlease. And so it is all a little bit piecemeal. But the Greater Sydney Task Force, where we've got people from state, federal and local government, um, we have people from the building sector, we've got people from health and uh, architects, engineers, um, Department of Health and the disaster, the rebuilding department from the federal government. So we're looking at the whole system because it is the way we build communities as well. So if you look at uh, even just tree canopy, you look at Western Sydney and Eastern Sydney, we don't really have any built outside places where kids can go outside and play. And people who are just poorer living in energy poverty can go outside and walk just for exercise. So they're kind of stuck at home yeah. running the air so, and getting the bill yeah, like so, never, never. Yeah. So it, it's actually intrinsically unfair because like the population's just getting less healthy. If you can't go out because it's too hot, because the safest place is maybe one of the rooms in your house then you don't actually have a community that connect with each other and that's that's a problem too besides being less healthy. In fact, affects the mental health of the population. Isolation and things yeah. like that. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of advocacy is going to having a better built outside space too so that, um, you know, kids can play. If you can't, if kids are stuck inside, you have a generation of kids who just don't connect with nature, with the outside, who play sport because it's too hot and... Um, so it is a systems approach and, uh, and there are people working in each area and it's so good that you're working where you are, Marcus. And Making because, these videos and making, being cranky. Oh, oh <laughs> you know, it's every bit of community we have to really connect with, okay? Mm. Um, so, uh, so going back to my house again, yeah, um, actually, I'm I, I oh, kind yeah. of looking for a way to yes. go back to 2007 and yeah, the start yeah. of the so, podcast. Yeah. So, because I was, my question is, what are all the things that somebody can do in their house yeah. to make it cooler yeah. and also uh, warmer in winter yeah. without breaking the bank? And yeah. so, the journey of what you did so far, um, you know, we you, you've improved it slowly. You planted the trees. What else did you do? Yeah, so I'm also a little bit of an energy nerd. So I've been reading this great journal um, magazine called Renew Economy mm. for a long time with Giles Parkinson. He also has a podcast. Mm. And um, so I followed the trend of solar, followed the trend of um, batteries, and for a long, long time, they were making batteries that you actually had to house because it couldn't deal with the climate extremes in Australia. So as soon as the Tesla battery came out, um, I kind of like registered for it. So I was one of the first 
uh, 50 people in 2015. So I've got a 6.4 kilowatt battery. Since oh, so you got you got you got the original Tesla one. Oh, yeah, I got the oh original. Oh my god, there, 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 there are not many of them around. Oh. Just to listeners to explain, uh, batteries don't like Australian climate if it gets hotter than 40, 50 degrees because it degrades a lot of the technology batteries that are currently around. And some of the more modern batteries, including the Tesla, they actually got a cooling system within the battery to keep the battery cool even in hot conditions. So you saw straight away that that was a good feasible product and therefore you put your yeah, hand up for it. you know what? It's a leap of faith, Marcus. Mm. Okay, when you actually sort of like adopt technology early, it's a leap of faith. Mm. So mm. I had my solar and the um, the Tesla battery put in and uh, and so by next year the whole system's 10 years old and it's still working so well. So the reason I decided to do a battery was because I was like, if you look at solar, when do you use solar? It's kind of like the peak hours are when you come home. So like I wanted to be able to use my own energy um, when I came home during the peak time. So yeah, so with because the battery. Because you're away during the day. Oh, yeah, because I'm working and the kids yeah. were at school. Mm. Um, so you when needed I came something home, to capture your solar. Yeah, so and I'm because I had drawn my energy use down so low, and that's why I've only got four kilowatts of panels on my roof. Um, that I had enough energy in the battery for us to use when we came home from work and school. Mm. And so, uh, and and then. Uh, so, so you're sure you're not kind of the. The, the kind of hovering mum with a stick over your kids so the poor no. kids are even scared uh, to turn the computer on? Oh, no, the kids have grown up with me. So it's kind of like they've grown up with knowing that everything is precious. Water's precious, energy's precious. All the plants around in our garden and everywhere else are precious. So they understood. Mm. So I didn't have to do that, um, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, and... Uh, so my power bill, when I had the whole system put in, was $64 a month. Wow. I'm oh, sorry, $64 a quarter, not a month. Oh, even so, better. Yeah, so $64 a quarter. For 21 apps. 33 a month. Yeah. That's a record. So, um, yeah. Cause, uh, so, you I, must, so you look forward to get your bill because <laughs> you go, gee, how well did we do this time? <laughs> wow, that's, a, that's an achievement. But mm -hmm. you had to invest in the first place yep. into the equipment yep. and into the insulation yep. and all of those things yep. to actually allow for that in the first place. Oh, absolutely. And I, I've i always been saving and kept a spreadsheet since I was 15 and working. So I, I kind of had the goal of actually doing that. Uh, so I realised that I'm not like everyone else because I was singularly focused on actually electrifying the house. Mm, mm. And... You know, you know, you need people who actually can show what is possible, mm. um, what can be done, because otherwise people can't see it. It's kind of like you, if you have your dream about something mm. and you want everyone to share in it, until you actually do it and take the steps and talk about it, people can't see it's possible. True, but you could also fall a prey to a door knocker who's going to promise you everything about a solar system and puts a crap system on uh, and you get tricked and all that because yeah. that's happened in this industry too. So oh, how do you absolutely. know who you can trust? Um, I've been lucky in that I know people in the solar industry now because mm. uh, when you're an early adopter, that's why I end up getting a lot of people asking you for advice mm. Mm. Um, so that I can point them in the right direction. Um, there is also a really good Facebook page called um, My Efficient Energy. Um, My Energy Efficient Home. home. Yes, yes. Mm, done by mm, Tim Forsey. Mm, so mm. that's a really good Facebook page to ask about what people have experienced with their providers for various things. Mm, mm. So there are places that people can look, but you're right, Marcus, there is still a problem because, um, you know, not everyone is actually – is ethical with their practices. So it's actually how do we get people to find the people who are ethical installers? Yeah, so. I personally think door knocking for solar and pretty well all services should just be stopped because a lot of times it traps the old pensioners who are at home uh, and, and sometimes get delivered crap at a price of a Rolls-Royce model. 
and they wouldn't know the difference. And so I just believe there's no room mm. in this industry for that mm. kind of stuff. That's yeah. just my personal opinion. Yeah. Stop the door knocking and a big problem of people being ripped off is mm. actually stopped. Yeah. And the no. politician should listen to it because it's very easy to implement that. Yeah. You know. But uh, coming back, so you got your house, you've done – your insulation in the roof, you've got a battery, mm -hmm. you've got the solar system, not a big one, but because your consumption is that, you changed your lighting, you got the trees, you got the water recycling mm -hmm. on the wall, um, and you got double glazing, did yeah, you? Yeah, I did. I did it in sort of three lots because unfortunately in Australia, double glazing is expensive. Um, I think it's coming down in price now. It's starting to slowly becoming a bit more of a mass product. I know of a place up in Western Sydney who set up recently a double glazing factory. Mm. And according to them, mm. the price point is now much reduced oh, to cool. what it was many years ago. Mm. Because I put double glazing in in 1986 mm. into a property, but more for noise reduction. Mm. Uh, I was near the train line. And for a couple of windows, I spent 16 grand. Mm. But I uh, believe it has come down a lot since then because there are more of them built. But, mm. but I personally, again, think double glazing should be mandatory. All those units along mm. the main roads mm. with aluminium windows, you sit up the top and all the trucks are rumbling past. How come we didn't insist that these are double glazed? It's crazy. It's because it's also, I mean, that's why I advocate in terms of better building standards because mm. it's an odd place for doctors to be. But um, it's critical for health that people so, don't so get fried. So make that connection to me because we're coming from high electricity bill and mm. maybe that's affecting mental health. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, how is actually the whole climate challenge, mm. Western Sydney and other places mm. in, in Australia and the upcoming heat waves mm. that we're going to experience, how is that affecting mental health? Look, I mean, the depth of the crisis was recently shown. There is the Australian Health and Welfare Institute published their data on climate deaths, and it looked at um, people who died from floods, um, from uh, bushfires, and from heat. And heat was still far ahead of all other visible threats. And so the the group that tended to die from heat waves was over sixty five, and men between the ages of twenty four and forty four. What, they're out there stupidly running still to the well, gym and getting a heat well, stroke? Well, not or? Ne necessarily. It's mainly in Queensland. But, you know, if you look at people who've died, it was, there was um, it's people who don't have a, a lot of times it's not people's choice as well. But people do understand. Oh, well, it's nobody's choice understand. as opposed yeah. to die. Yeah. So, I, what you, what and I'm mean? talking about like they have no choice. Like if you work – one, a couple of ah, you mean the people who are working right yeah, up on so, roofs and things yeah, like so that. Yeah, so if is you it? have, if you don't have, don't have control over your work situation, mm. even for cleaners who work in really hot buildings overnight because the air conditioning's not on, people who work outside who work on roofs, um, and people still underestimate how heat kills them. But we can see just from the data that yeah, a, a group is the twenty-four to forty-four year old men. So. Most people who die from heat, uh, is, it is the vulnerable group. It's people with heart disease, lung disease, uh, diabetes, kidney disease. But if it gets hot enough, all of us are going to be impacted. And we know that in, um, in Western Sydney that it is 10, to 10 degrees, up to 10 degrees hotter during mm. Mm. heat waves. And so and the, the number, there's one third more of the the emergencies are one third more busy. There's we don't actually. So you mean emergency departments are busy from from hospitals closer to the city mm. versus hospitals more in the west. You're saying on really hot days, the Western Sydney hospitals are more overloaded with um, heat related um, issues. That's is it? right, heat related issues, and it's not just um, physical um, impacts of heat like heart attacks and strokes. It is actually also people who are, we know that heat increases domestic violence. You can talk to the cops and they'll say, they'll show you the data is higher in hot days. There's more suicide um, during heat waves. There's more, um, uh, there's also more self-harm. Um, and so we know that um, within communities, it's still that the isolated people who are living in really hot houses if, so if you're socially isolated and you don't have actually someone who looks after you to make sure you drink, those people are also more likely to die. 
But those people are also vulnerable with any crisis. So if you've got somebody who's got dementia now, but mm. people around him, the family believes yeah. they're still okay to look after themselves, no. that could be a dangerous that, day uh, oh, when it's very yeah, hot, is that, it? That, that is. So really when I actually, so this is why general practice is in a more important place because we know who our vulnerable patients are. We mm. know who's living alone. Mm. We know that. Um, so all those people, I make sure that I know who their next of kin is. Mm. And that they mm. live geographically close, mm. so that my patients who are uh, in who might be at risk, and that's including mums and babies and pregnant women as well, they have somewhere to go, that's a cooler place. Um, so, so that the, my patients have a heat plan as well, but it's not necessarily so that um, that everyone has somewhere that where they can, can go, and that's why part of the reason. And Blacktown Council knew this and the State Department knew this, that we needed heat shelters for people who didn't have cool places to go, who are at risk from energy poverty. So Blacktown Council for the last three years has had heat shelters so that people could go there on a hot day to be safe. Well, isn't that just the big, the local shopping centre? Oh, no, it is that. <laughs> you go no, in there, no. that's all air conditioning. I know, it's not that as well. Because if you get a bunch of teenagers in a shopping centre to be cool, they'll be kicked out. So there is also churches, pools, uh, the library. Um, and so, and these are widely advertised for the heat waves this year. But this is only, you know, this is. I mean, um, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have even considered a, a heat shelter. For mm. energy deprived people, I mean, it's all a very new concept. Is are you sure yeah. this is what's going to where we're going to no, go? No, no, because this is actually you know we have to do everything we can to keep people safe and alive. And the heat shelter thing is one thing you can do. The people who are living in energy poverty, where there's no quick fix for a lot of people at the moment, mm. is to see what the community can do to actually keep people safe. You know, Marcus, there's very so many gaps within but our then, community. But then, I mean, I'm sorry to be – I come across very negative here today, mm -hmm. but let's say I'm stuck in a fibre place from mm. the 1950s. Mm. There's a bit of insulation there, but I can't afford the air con. It's getting really hot. Now, I heard that the council has set up an energy shelter two k's down the road at the mm. local library. I'm still stuck at home. Yeah, so that's why – How do why, I get there? Yeah, so that's why the council also did bus a bus service as well. I mean, it is – there's multiple things that can be done. That's why, you know, we know that there's so many people living in the situation where they're stuck in energy poverty and they're unsafe. It's But it's at, only going to get worse with oh, the absolutely. climate getting hotter. It is, absolutely. So you kind of have to multitask when you're doing this. People have to understand that heat is a risk. You have to have um, policies and... Um, really things on the ground that where people can access information, you need them to access safe places. You need to legislate. So like Penrith Council now, if you build a house there, you need a cool room. So one room that's insulated so that if it's a heat wave, you have a room that's cool. So that's what Pen Penrith Council has done. There are councils that – so. It is the, the federal government, the state government and local understanding the building codes, how we build communities is so important. It requires all of us to work with this and that's why it seems like overwhelming and complicated. Mm, it really mm. does, doesn't I it, mean, Marcus? I mean, uh, yeah, 15 yeah. bureaucrats stuck in one room. Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen the comedy shows about that. Yeah, you know? so there are so many p people working in each sector, including a whole bunch of architects I know, engineers I know, mm. who are kind of working everywhere to network to get the big push to actually get more stuff that's meaningful done. And so you know, we're not faffing around the edges so that at the moment we're trying to get councils to connect. So if one council's doing something effectively, another council the next door replicated. mayor is going to be jealous of him and he's <laughs> going to just do the opposite um, so the so, park doesn't look uh, yeah, good. I mean, so that's the, the local politics. Uh, so have you heard of the City's Power Partnership? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So the City's Power Partnership is um, started by the Climate Council and what there are about 100, oh, it could be more, it's 100 to 150 councils who are there and that platform is to look at ways councils have done energy efficiency and um, canopy and all those things to um, improve communities. 
So it's on one platform so councils can share what they've done. And so there are places that councils are if trying to actually replicate what's being done in another similar community so they're not working from scratch. So you don't um, waste energy and time with trying to develop a new process when it's already been developed by another council. So there are a whole bunch of things being done to look at circular economies. Hornsby Karingai Council has done a um, circular economy document. Um, and uh, so there are, in the West has started FOGO to look at waste, organic waste. Uh, well, that went all belly up. Um, yeah. It's, because, it's, because uh, I mean, I, I got a property in that area mm. and they just decided to take your bin away every second mm. week mm. and they already given you a small bin. So it wasn't like a huge bin. So, mm. And um, the communication about that was atrocious. Uh, it, no, I, I realise. It, it, it threw people into a spin and I've never seen the inner West people actually being reasonable radical. They're kind of more mature and... <laughs> Easygoing ABC listeners and all that. Jesus Christ, did they get cranky when the when yeah. all the maggots so, came out from okay. two weeks out of their bin? Okay. I'm, so I'm sorry to be a bit. Uh, I've uh, experienced that. Yeah. So I think one very important thing yeah. is if you want to bring the community along. Oh, you've got to do good communication. Oh, communication's really, really, really important. Um, so even like looking at um, indoor gas. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I hear that you say that there are health issues with indoor gas. Uh, I the, mean, Asian people love cooking with gas. Oh, I realise that. So, you know. Uh, when, anybody actually, really, yeah. barbecues and all that. I yeah. shouldn't kind but of specify any groups here. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? When you actually do a barbecue, it's outside. The trouble is when you're combusting um, gas inside your home, mm. you're creating the air pollution inside your house. And what we know, and like people have measured this, that when you combust gas inside your house, you get particulate matter, you get aqueous air pollutants and get volatile organic compounds. So things like um, nitrous dioxide, which is we know actually increases, um, sensitizes kids to house dust mite, um, and also increases the risk of asthma. Um, we've got particulate pollutants, and we know that par microparticulate pollutants are the little little particles that you breathe in that you can go to every single system in your body and it can actually cause inflammation. So people with lung disease, heart disease will be worse with it. We know that with... So you're basically saying there's a lot doing gas heating, just the unflued gas yes, heating in your bad. house. This is cooking, the cooking. Mm. So we know that... With cooking, there's also volatile organic compounds like formaldehyde and benzene that's found in gas when you combust it. So if you're cooking with a gas cooktop, you have to make sure that the whole area is really well ventilated or you act, or you have a really good extractor fan. But, 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 but look, I make some spaghettis. That's eight minutes worth yeah. of one little flame. Yeah. My kitchen is decent size. Yeah. What would that little bit of yeah. gas? I mean, it couldn't make it much of a diff. Yes, and the diff also they've found that with gas cooktops, it also emits... Um, the pollutants, even when they're turned off. Oh, really? Yeah. It's been measured. What, it kind of seeps out just a little bit, does it? Mm. And, and the, I mean, if you have a really well-ventilated house that's really mm. good um, and you have a well-ventilated kitchen that's really good. So so are you saying use the um, fan, yeah, yeah. the extractor fan, fan. if you cook and, with and gas to, and, and all that, use yeah. that? Yeah, and to, vent it. Try to have your mm, extractor fan and vent out of the roof of your it, house. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So that's something interesting. What about the – I mean, I actually heat my house sometimes with gas, and I've got just that gas heater that kind of just spews it out mm. of the back. So you're making me a little bit scared there. Yeah, I mean, you can actually buy an air quality monitor. monitor. Mm. I've got a Dyson one, mm. um, and it can tell you the level of um, – Particulate matter, nitrous dioxide, and volatile organic compounds. You can actually check your own. I've got risk. two dogs who fart a lot. That thing will go off like oh. hell. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can lock the do dogs in another area and and put the monitor in there. So you can you can check your own house. Mm, okay, so you're saying actually what you use inside the house uh, from possibly cleaning material to the gas can actually affect the living environment, the breathing and all oh, yeah, that. Yeah, because you're breathing it in. If you can smell it, it's going up 
up your nose. Mm, so, mm. And, like, and there's no indoor quality monitor, indoor air quality guidelines in Australia. Right, We've right. got outdoor ones, mm. but we don't have indoor ones. Mm. So it's really, people really have to co- be cognizant of when their indoor air quality. Um, and so, I mean, so we're, we're trying to encourage people to understand that the air pollution and that if they can afford it to change to something that's well, at the moment the best technology is induction. I, I was going to just say, I mean, uh, saying, oh, this is no good, don't use it. So what's the best for heating the house yep. um, and, and get off the – because the gas is really used in three ways, mm. mainly in the house. Mm. It's the hot water, mm-hmm. uh, it's the heating of the house, and also it's the cooking. Mm. So what are the three technologies that are okay. maybe cheaper to run and more healthy? Okay. So – um, with the hot water, I've had. Um, I'm just lucky that I've very got a big hot water tank sitting in the hottest part of my house, mm. the garage. So it's a big mass of water that's always hot. So it's if you can electrify your hot water heating, um, it actually makes it cheaper because gas is going up in price. So electricity is going to be cheaper from now on anyway. But so hang on, if I run my hot water on electricity, mm-hmm. wouldn't I then try to maybe put a timer on it so no, that the solar in the middle of the day mm. is mainly responsible to heat you can. my water? You can do that, yeah. Or what about a heat pump? I now, okay, efficient. you can use it. Okay, now the the absolutely amazing things about heat pumps, and I'm not an engineer, the way I understand it is with a heat pump, you're grabbing energy from the outside air. Mm. And so you're not making energy because actually if you're making heat, you're going to use more energy, but you're actually grabbing air from outside and bringing it inside the house. So it's movement of air and it's much cheaper. So heat pumps are the cheapest way to heat your house. I think the way that heat pump people explain it, it works reverse to a fridge. Mm. Um, It actually takes the heat outside and then through some uh, Mm. compressing of the gas Mm. and all that, you're actually creating a heat source that then exchanges with the water running in that area and the water slowly mm. is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So the amount of energy required mm. is relatively yep. lower yep. because you're using already some yep. of the energy yep. that's in the air outside. Mm. So yep. you, so that so we're going for heat pump. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the cooking? So with the cooking, I use induction. I've had my induction cooktop for three years. Mm. Now, the upfront cost is pretty high. It's up there because... Um, you actually have to have a separate connection from your power from your power board outside. Ah, uh, so it yeah. it it, it, it yeah. sucks up quite a bit of energy. So you need a special fuse mm. and a special. Yep. So you need to run a cable yeah, through the house, house for that. Yeah. Okay, so that's and a cost, as well as the induction itself. Yep. But then inductions don't do they last only five, six, eight years, or do they uh, last look, a long time? No, look, I I bought the best induction cooktop I could buy at the time. I bought the induction mm. cooktop. And there is no time in time on it. Right. Um, right. And so I think the amazing thing about it is um, when you stand next to a gas cooktop, it's hot when mm. you stand next to it. Mm. Um, it's cool. Like you, you're not hot when you're standing next to an induction cooktop. And it's instant. Like when you change the, the power, it's an instant change of heat. It's so quick. And I do, my um, cultural background is from Malaysia. So I cook a, a cuisine called Nonya. It's Malay, it's Malay, Chinese and Indian. And so we do a lot of stir fries in it. And it's been perfect for all those stir fries. Um, right. I thought the only good way to make a stir fry is on a gas. No. No. I, you know, I, I ran an induction cooktop um, workshop in the Inner West last week where I did um, spring rolls and cha kwe tiao. So cha kwe tiao is like um, sort of Malaysian version of a pad thai. And, um, and so it was to show that you could get the, what we call wok he, which is like is the heat and like people usually associate with gas cooking, mm. the heat that you get from the cooktop. Mm. Yeah, you can get wok he from um, induction. Okay. So it's people who criticise induction haven't actually used induction. Um and I'm saying the gas industry has been really powerfully marketing a gas cooktop for many years. Mm, mm. And so it's – because I tell you the person who's now – who loves their induction is my 82-year-old mother. So she's been cooking with gas for absolute ages. And one day she was – turned on her gas 
and all the basically every single cooktop just lit. And I thought, oh, mum, we need to make it safer for you. Because the trouble is that you have the risk with the, the flames as well with someone who's 82. So, well, if they leave it on yeah, and yeah. then the spark and the, comes, and the, the house that, goes bingo bongo. Yeah, that's right. So we changed to an induction cooktop. Then I wasn't actually constantly worried about her with the gas cooktop. Mm, and mm. she loves her induction cooktop now. And she does all her stir frying. So if I can get my 82-year-old mother to love her induction cooktop, I'm pretty much convinced anyone. Mm. But don't you, like, you can't use aluminium pots on them yeah, and stuff look, like that. Don't yeah. you need to kind of then buy a whole yeah, suite of new so, expensive pots? Yeah, look, it depends. I, I've been collecting Les Crusettes. Pots, iron pots mm. for the last 35 years. So all of those pots actually work. Oh. Okay. And so I did have to give away my steel cookware and I, I did gradually, I've actually increased, I bought the wok, the induction wok first out of all the new things I bought. And yeah, it works perfectly great. So it, like with anything you know, I've done, I've done things gradually. Mm. So even when I flipped over to induction, I'm adding to things gradually. It would be great if all that knowledge is with people because when there's a young couple and they start mm. furnishing the house and buying the stuff, they go more for the fashion trend look rather than the energy stuff. So how do they get that kind of knowledge? Because mm. I'm not going to say Harvey Norman or the good yeah. guys or so, but the sales guys there, yeah. they'll they'll sell other features. Yeah, so, you know, what? it's to make it cool. You know, it's cool to have something that uses less energy. Right. Um so it's – and I think a lot of young people are understanding that energy efficiency is really important. That's why there's such a big advocacy group regarding this amongst young people now um, because, you know, we have to transition um, and you know that and that's why you're doing this podcast. And we We're, just we're trying to educate people but yeah. we see a lot of hurdles, you know, because yeah. I don't think – a lot of the politicians still get it. And, and i tell you why. Yeah. If you go to Canberra yep. and you look at who's going there, if they haven't gone to a private school and have a reasonable mm. middle-class background, mm. they're definitely in the minority of all the politicians yep. there. And so therefore, them sitting in a fibre house in Western Sydney and wondering if they can afford to turn the aircon on today mm. or not, and is it just so hot or can I still live with it, um, that is not an experience that they have. So how the hell can they care yeah. for it? I suppose there are more people who have got the lived experience, but they also have to remember the lived experience when they're making decisions. You know what I mean? Because um, so either, you know, we need to get people who have got the lived experience to run for politics. I suppose that's one thing. We have to have the community. Because in the end, politicians don't lead they follow depending on where the money comes from and how the community is. So like the only thing like we have to offer in a way for the community is to really advocate. So so make people, well, you need to people feel unsafe in their seat if they don't actually do the right thing. Which means that the majority has to get off their apathy and actually give their politicians a bit of a stick. Oh, Absolutely. Mm, okay. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, we're, it's to multitask and do everything mm. that you can that's meaningful. Um, but, I mean, we we just established people are in the time poor, uh, money mm. isn't the same it let anymore. Mm. Now we're not going to kick our local politicians to care for the things that actually affect us. It's yep. a big job. But coming back to the house, mm. uh, we kind of started there and we kind of keep on coming back. <laughs> um, we were talking about gas being used for hot water and mm. you saying maybe the heat pump or yep. an electric, yep. uh, the old electric kettle, which was really a baddie, get rid of it. Mm. Now with solar, it's actually not a bad oh, no. way to go. Yeah. But then what was the other one? Oh, the heating. How do I heat my house if I get rid of gas? Oh, with the heat pump. Which is an air conditioner, is it? Yeah, it is. It is. Right, right. And you, again, would put a big enough solar system on the front end to drive that uh, yeah. during the day? So what I did was I selected the rooms that the hottest mm. and the ones most lived in. So I installed it in my daughter's room, my son's room and the uh, family room. So the rest of the house is not air conditioned. You didn't get it in your own bedroom? No, because I've got the coolest bedroom. Right. Yeah. So I didn't bother because I've got a fan there anyway. Okay. So we've got, so what we also have is we've got uh, DC fans in each room. 
So those are the most energy efficient. So they've got little inverter in the fan to convert because when you plug things in, it's alter- alternating current. Mm. But they've developed um, little engines for, uh, for direct current that are more efficient. Mm. So I've got energy efficient fans in all the rooms. Right, right, right. So when you go shopping mm-hmm. for any appliance, be the vacuum or the washing machine, you actually really make sure you look at the energy footprint, is it? Oh, absolutely. Because there is a star system, so you can follow the star system. Mm. And um, there, and really, all most appliances have the star system as a sticker on on the appliance itself when you go to shops. Mm, mm. And uh, you can go to I mean, places, good sources like Choice Magazine, um, that you can actually look at um, the energy efficiency and the I suppose how robust a product is mm, from Choice mm, Magazine. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So I, I think uh, now most air conditioners, washing machines, dishwashers do have the star rating and mm. it's very simple. The more star, the mm. more efficient. So don't just judge it by the looks but That's also right. go with the star. And and if something is three, $400 more expensive but has two stars extra, Within two or three years, you're going to get that money back on oh. your on your electricity oh, bill. That's right. So therefore, uh, you think a bit more long term than just short term, and jump a little bit higher mm. on the mm. cost initially to purchase. Mm. All right. Now coming back to you being actually a doctor, which which is how we kind of thought we'd <laughs> invite you. And I mean, it, it, we've talked about pretty well a lot of energy efficient mm. matters, but mm. not the doctor thing. Mm. You were talking first that. Actually, the new heat waves we will get with climate change mm. coming, especially in Western Sydney, mm. has a mental health connection. Yeah. Um, most people would really sit there. If you if I'd go to a street and ask with a question, a question and a quiz, mm. um, more heat in Western Sydney, how does it affect mental health? Ninety nine percent of people would say no idea. No, no one would say. How did you feel? You know, sleeping through the heat wave last night, or how how do you feel? And most people will say they're, because I do ask, that they do feel uncomfortable, they can't sleep, mm. they're trying to keep cool. Mm. So we know that if you don't sleep, if you even if you don't have any sort of mental illness, it's going to disrupt your day. And when you actually, what what is a heat wave? Heat wave is when you have three days with the maximum um, high or low temperature for three days that's a typical for that area. That's the definition of a heat wave. So if a heat wave's three days, a lot, a lot of people might be able to handle it. But the problem what, that we have is that what ha- happens when you get days over 35 de- degrees when it's just lots of days mm. and it's really humid. Mm. Now, that's really quite dangerous. Humid, you mean? Humid heat mm. is really mm. dangerous because it's harder to cool down. Because mm. um, if, if you look at the process of how the body cools down, we actually move blood to our skin. So that our, our blood vessels in in our in our periphery dilate, mm. and we sweat. So, what happens is that um, this is how people have heart attacks and strokes. If your heart is vulnerable already, and you're getting hotter, and most of your most of your blood's pushed to your periphery, your heart's not being perfused properly. So, if you have heart failure or you're prone to heart of heart attack, that's when people can die from heat waves. If you live in a hot house. You don't even have to have a rise in temperature to make your heart work so much harder. But you're not aware of it? People might not be aware of it. That's mm. why people who actually have all these predisposing factors need to have other people they're connected with who can look in on them on hot days. So because, you know, our, our, our thirst is, is really not related to how dehyd- necessarily how dehydrated we are. Because when you get dehydrated, it can actually disorientate you. So some people just become cranky when they're actually um, dehydrated. And so you might think it could be a cranky old bugger, but it's just because they're dehydrated. I maybe need a bit more water here. (laughs) So I remember walking, I was walking in, I was just walking in Carlingford one day and um, I saw this guy who was just looking really cranky. He was an older gentleman. I just looked at him and I thought... Yeah, I think you're just a bit dehydrated. So I said, where do you live? So I just walked him to where he lived mm-hmm. and where his daughter was. And he had diabetes and he'd just gone out walking without taking a drink with him. So he was dehydrated without knowing he was dehydrated. Um, because, you know, when you're just cranky and you're not thinking properly, you don't think that water necessarily water will help you. You don't feel – you just don't think. And so you know, I had a patient who um, – decided to work in his son's shed 
on a was 39 degree day. That was the ambient temperature outside. Mm. But inside the shed, it was a lot hotter. Mm. And so he was in there for hours and he forgot to take his drink and the it was the builder had turned the um, the taps off. And so by the time he arrived, he left feeling really dizzy. He had leg cramps. He drove home and collapsed in the chair. And so he was significantly dehydrated um, and in the end, they, they called the ambulance and he had kidney failure by the time he got to hospital. That's because he was acutely dehydrated. He recovered really quickly when he got the IV fluids. But um, he was working in the shed and not realising, and this is one of my really well patients who's 60, and he just, he could have died in there if his wife hadn't called the ambulance and given him, like, given him, put him in a cool place and gave him drinks. Mm. So people can do things um, really and not plan for heat waves. So, so um, there's an ignorance there, really. Yeah. So I'll sh there, there is an app that's um, been developed by Sydney Uni that I get all my patients to download. You can probably share that app. Mm. And what it does is it gives you the temperature of the day for your region mm. and the hottest part of the day. Mm. So I tell my patients, look at this app in the morning so it actually goes through what clothes you should be wearing, like clothing, how much you should be drinking, what you should be doing. So it's only when it's in the green zone that you can go outside and exercise. Mm. So people have something that they can look at to actually guide them during the day. So it's so, so important. And, and this is part of the reason it's really important that all workspaces actually look at heat waves. Uh, the Electrical Services Union in Victoria actually did a survey with their members, or all electricians, um, about heat waves and how it impacted them. And they found that really impacted their mental health and physical well-being because they did a survey about those two things. Because mm. electricians do crawl into dark, hot places. And so they understood, that was the first study with um, in the large group place. So people understand I've spoken to, because um, the police are also in the Greater Sydney Heat Task Force, and the police have a heat plan as well um, regarding what to do for police on hot days, although it's not necessarily followed, because uh, I do little surveys with my patients who are police how much they know about the heat <laughs> plan that the police have. So all workplaces need to have a heat plan as well. So what I do ask my patients is wherever they work, do they have control over whether they can go inside, what time they can start or finish work. So my, I've got a couple of patients who are roofers and they run their own business. And on hot days, they know, look at the weather ahead and see if it's a hot day. They start work at four. They just tell, you know. Four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, four o'clock in the morning because by nine o'clock, if it's hot, they stop work. Right, right, But not right. everyone has control over their work like people mm. who run their own business. Mm. So mm. we need to, um, every single work where people could be vulnerable with heat waves need to actually have a heat work heat plan. But look, I mean, it's scary what is going to come to the generation oh. going forward because, oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, if you believe that we can keep it to 1.5 degrees, which I think we've already overshot, mm. overshot mm. and there's so many interests mm. to still fuel the fire, uh, we've got to be prepared that it will get hotter, but then the person's responsibilities is, is, you know, now you've added another thing. I've got to pick up the kids. I've got to keep the house clean. I've got to save up for a rainy day. I want to go on holidays. Now I've got to have a heat plan. I mean, wouldn't you actually expect the people that we elect into the positions of leadership, your politicians of local, state and federal government, to, sorry, proverbially pull their finger out mm. and actually get some major actions going? When we had COVID, major actions were done very quickly. I look mm. in Western Sydney, and in some areas now, there's less trees than in 1986. So mm. they sit there and they go, oh, we're planting 10,000 trees, 10,000 little saplings, mm. put it in a big place like Blacktown or mm. Fairfield or Liverpool, 80% will be dead within a year because nobody's watered them. Yeah. It's a good, nice little line in the annual report, mm. but I'm not seeing those trees I grow. Know. Yeah, so Marcus, it was actually the state government said a million trees, not a thousand. So and I still haven't seen I know, a big difference. It is, it, yeah, they, they actually did do a, a review of that, and he, you know, what? It's still education. 
um, within the community because they did put in saplings to start off with. Yeah. Um, and people just didn't look after it. Now they put in trees that are substantial in size so that people can see it. And what they've done is they've found that if you get a local champion for that tree in that street, that tree is more likely to survive. So, like, you don't need to educate the whole street. You just need to educate a few people mm. who can educate other people. But um, And land care, the state government has actually got land care to help roll out the um, – the million trees thing now. Yeah, but I mean, that's going to go into Western City parklands and places like mm. that. I talk about local streets mm. in Western Sydney in my own street, mm -hmm. which is a suburb that was built in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. I don't have a single tree, mm. maybe two or three in a street that's a couple of hundred metres long. Mm. I've now got some bottle brushes, 40 mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. planted them, might feel they're about this big, mm. and now I walk around the neighbourhood asking for permission in front of their house to put that bottle brush tree mm. and then I put one by one in mm. there, which mm. is kind of, you know, they all think I'm a bit nuts no, to do that. Didn't you plant some mangoes? Yeah, I planted <laughs> one mango tree too to see if that if that gets more attractive. So, so, <laughs> People yeah. fight over that yeah, one so, mango on the tree. Yeah. But my point is you got to do stuff like that, but why should it be me to do yeah. it? Why is the local council not having a plan that all streets with street treat opportunity getting the streets in Western Sydney so we get the heat down? So it, in a way it's up to – have you spoken to your council, Marcus? <laughs> I've spoken to my council and I don't believe that particular mayor loves trees, so that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> oh, dear. Mm. No, because I spoke to mine because when the Million Trees Project came out, they actually appointed one person in my council to roll it out and they had the program through Bunnings, so Bunnings was supplying the trees. And the problem was then that person became sick and had no one else managing the program. So, uh, it, look, it, it's... So you're actually it, on my side that, uh, yeah. you know... It shouldn't be a minor thing. No. We've got a department for veteran affairs. We've got a department mm. for women. We, mm. Why is Western Sydney and getting bloody trees on our streets not a priority yeah, for I Mr know. Mintz? I know. And you know what? There is a – isn't there a minister of Western Sydney as well? Yes. Uh, they usually get a bit extra money for that and go to a couple of sway events. And other than that, I don't know what they've done. <laughs> Anyway, look, um, it's a, yeah. I think it comes back to people and their own responsibility because if everybody would recognise mm. and put a good tree in front of their house or in their garden, a bit away from the house, mm. then obviously it would overall help, but you have to pick the right tree. Yep. So, yeah, so there is actually, I know with my council, there's a list of trees you can actually plant. Right. So they've actually looked at the trees that don't um, up, sort of uproot your footpath mm. and they've looked at trees that um, don't cause... That aren't toxic. So there is a list of trees. Most councils will have a list of trees for the local local area. Mm -hmm. So it's not up to – because most people don't know about trees, really, as in like the right one to plant where. Well, I hear my wife is an Asian background. She said, well, in our culture, if the tree doesn't bring fruit or something or mm. nice flowers, mm. we don't want that tree. It's got no purpose. Mm. So, you know, that makes, that makes complete <laughs> sense. Like I've got – well, me, I, I just love crepe myrtles and they make great shade trees. Those little so, orange, they have the pink pink flowers, yeah, do they? Yeah, yeah they yeah. grow quite big and they're really mm. robust during droughts mm. as mm. in like they they survive without much water. Mm. So mm. I've got those. and What, um, as a street tree or on your block? Uh, yes, on my block. Mm. Well, mm. those planted close to the street. So it is a street tree. <laughs> mm. Right, right. So, yeah. so it's, um, yeah, so it's really trying to have other people have the same understanding regarding mm. trees and the importance. Mm. Um, mm. And, you know, the um, other important things about trees is that they clean water. Like, you know, Melbourne's um, water system mm. is primarily cleaned by trees. So we can reduce the amount of chemicals in water systems by using trees. Uh, no, I'm deviating. Sorry, Marcus. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look, we are zigzagging a little bit around, but what we're actually really highlighting is that these things are connected. Yeah. Because if you – explain to me that in heatwave times we have more domestic violence issues because people are more dehydrated and cranky and it's they're all stuck together and all that. Uh, somebody that's running the ambulance service would probably say, oh, it's a hot day. We know we're going to get more calls about yep. certain issues. So it is all interconnected oh, in some way. But coming back to the mental health, what's your own personal experience with heat and climate change and the mental health and what are some practical things we can do about it okay my mental health when i know it's a heat wave i just 
feel really flat because I know what my patients are going to go through during summer. Mm. So it's really just preparing them as much as possible so they know that like they actually prepare for a heat wave. Mm. So they've got uh, sort of lots of drinks in the freezer that they freeze towels and they make sure that all the fridge is actually working, all their devices are working. They um, actually have a heat plan for their near and dear. They know that if they go out, it's only going to be, has to be in the cool part of the day because it's really important that people actually go outside their house for their mental health. So that to plan outings for their families on cool days. So that's, you know, in a way, that's why the heat app that you can share, which looks at forecasts for mm. what to do, mm. is actually can keep people safe. I know my patients who really aren't safe because they've got no way of heating and cooling their house. And those are the people I, I actually give them the list for the heat shelters mm. and to make sure they have transport there. Um, and... I make sure that we actually have all GPs understanding this as well mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if all general practitioners actually told, connected with their patients regarding heat waves and advocate for better policies, um, that would be because 90% of people do see a GP, mm -hmm. so that's really important. Um, my college really understands it and um, I'm also on the council of the AMA and they understand it as well. So all our lead medical colleges understand the problems with health and climate change because we're dealing with the patients who are going to be impacted. But are we already going through the main majority of it or is it still in front of us uh, and it's going to hit us like uh, a look, brick wall? And it's just things are just going to get more frequent. We're going to get more frequent and more, more prolonged heat waves, more frequent floods. Um, we're going to get more frequent pandemics. Um, so why, why would that be? I mean, I thought COVID was a one-off. Oh, no. Because, look, if you look at um, systems in place, we're encroaching on nature all the time. And nature does carry viruses. All nature, we all carry viruses. And so, um, and the way that we have air travel, so things can travel overseas very rapidly. Um, and so the system, so it's it's interrelated. Disease is interrelated. Um, there's a very good book you can read, Marcus, and all of this is called Fevered Planet. So when you actually lose nature, you actually change the climate as well. We actually lose all the microorganisms that keep the soil healthy so and keep the soil in place. If we lose nature, we desiccate an area so that the weather systems change over it. Now, this is why if you look at the way Australia is deforested as well, because we have a lot of deforestation in New South Wales and Queensland, And um, with the Amazon, there's large areas that are being deforested. And really, you know, think about these are the lungs of the earth. Trees draw down carbon. If you lose trees, you lose the insects that live in that tree. You lose the organisms that live in the soil. Um, and so it's disrupted. And all the animals that live in that tree and all, hum all animals carry bacteria and viruses like There are more viruses and bacteria that we carry around that live in symbiosis with our body than cells in our body. So it's disrupting the flow of life. So, yes, when we disrupt nature, there are going to be more diseases. But the way you describe it, um, and we have been living for millions of years with mm. all those viruses and all that, and we mm -hmm. have survived as a species, But if you look at the TV ads at night, the Clen 20 should be out there any day to make us all healthy. Isn't that the truth? Oh, it's hard, isn't it? You can only spray so much Clen 20. Like if you looked at COVID, it's a respiratory virus. Mm. So it's airborne. And a lot of viruses that kids pass around in school is airborne. And the trouble with airborne viruses is that they're easy flow. If you look at an airplane, no one's going to be wearing a mask on the airplane. So even COVID has been crept up again with people on air travel. Mm. Uh, all, a lot of the viruses that um, we deal with normally have been around during this time when should be less viruses around. Normally during the school holidays and summer, there's less viruses around. But at the moment, we just, I, I'm seeing sick people still. So... Uh, and what do you do? I mean, do you just pop in a couple of pills like uh, most doctors do. I mean, I find when I go to a doctor, um, 
I kind of tell them what I got, etc. And it feels like they just go into the shelf and look at number 52 and just slap it on and whatever medicine it is and <laughs> God, God yeah. forgiven and off yeah, you so go. I mean, I don't actually feel that the doctor is talking to me like what you're doing to explain actually how things are all interrelated. So... They yeah. want me in and out as quick as possible. <laughs> no, look, it, it depends why you want to be a doctor <laughs> too. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, no, look, it's if, even if you look at the way I explain things to my medical students is that we have the bi biological determinants of health, what you've inherited, like if you've got family history of diabetes, heart disease, if you've got any family history of cancer, then the extra layer on top of that is your social determinants of health whether you have access to fresh food, uh, to energy, um, all the things where we healthy go to school, how they're living, mm. then you've got the commercial determinants of health, tobacco, alcohol, processed food industry, fossil fuel industry. So all of those industries have really powerful marketing tools. Mm. So, um, and then you look at the environmental determinants of health, our air, our water, healthy soils, a uh, stable climate and healthy ecosystem. So without the environmental determinants of health being healthy, we can't have a healthy population. And then mean, there's each, all these systems in place. Each individual, I mean, you've just described, um, you know, a fairly l large and powerful group of people. I live in Western Sydney. Mm. I've got no control over the traffic that is near mm. my house and spews out the pollution. Mm. I've got no traffic, uh, no uh, control over the heat load that is in my local area. Whatever my politicians make their priority, mm. usually I have no. And whatever I go into a supermarket, I walk through supermarket aisles now and I go, I play a game and I go, I'm not going in an aisle that has stuff with a high salt or sugar mm. content because I know at my age it's probably not good to have too much of that. There's some aisles in the supermarket I cannot go into mm -hmm. if I don't want to buy junk. Mm. And, and I actually say the Coles and Woolworths of this world, there should be a link between what they offer and our health system because the government is actually paying for the health system support, but they got no input in the first place at the front what goes in people's mouth, which causes the health issue in the first place. So why isn't there a loop? Yeah, it's like we've been trying to look at getting a sugar tax for ages. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico's done it and there's quite a few countries have done it, uh, which um, at the moment is focused on um, just soft drinks. But if you look at Australia as a whole, at uh, the population, Australians have more salt in their food. Okay, if you, you can actually calculate that on a population level. And everyone's blood pressure is slightly higher in Australia. So what because we, we we're have, getting more salt in our a lot uh, of peanut processed, butter uh, yep. uh, yep. So, you know, on top of the bread. So and, yeah, okay. there are, you know, like there, there are, you can, if you look at yourself and what you can do, like I just walk around the outside aisles of the supermarket and like only, that's only like once every couple of weeks, so I mainly go through the fruit shop. Um, and it is, it's really difficult because processed food is sometimes, and fast food is cheaper than actually fresh food. Mm. And sometimes it's more accessible. Mm. So, so the processed food industry is very powerful as well because um, they've got the marketing. Because some, some of these companies, I think your marketing company section of your company must be bigger than the actual food production. Um, so... Look, it's educating. Part of it is educating mothers. We know that if you educate mothers about this, about processed foods, you that's the most effective and cost-efficient way instead of dealing with kids when they're older. But I know, so, oh, but you, you're going to put that mum into the kid in – I'm in the mm. supermarket now. There's my toddler. I'm now going in. All I want to do is buy a bit of food for my family. What I didn't realise is behind this – is marketing machine after marketing mm. after marketing machine, which psychologically has decided the color of the package. The supermarket has decided which eye level they yep. put it. I'm sitting now right at the checkout. They've put all these temptations for my toddler in there. And I, as a little person, have all day got to fight back, fight back, fight back. That's very exhausting. It is. And, you know, it, it's still looking, it's still a way of, because most mothers will actually go to an early childhood centre. Mm. So that um, with all my patients, I actually do have the talk about fast foods. 
And if a kid walks in with an Oreo or a packet of Pringles, I'll just say, you know, the, this is not real food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not real food. So uh, most, so most of my mu- young mums with kids understand that, and we just actually, it's. I mean, and most doctors know this. So it's really, and most early childhood pe- nurses know this. So it's connection with someone they trust that he can get reliable information from. Well, Phil, I, I'd say that's true, and I suppose the Oreo and the Pringles won't help with the dental health either, does it? No. Yes. Okay. So, but I mean, it's 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 really, we wake up, and and the whole day is like running through a maze of where people try to get us. Yeah. So. And all we want to do is stay healthy. Yeah. So it's also be you know like, you kind of need to be cognizant of. Um, cognizant. Hesit. That's that's another word yeah. in Western Sydney. People go, "What the hell is she uh, talking yeah. about?" You so mean aware? Aware, educated about, well, health literacy. Mm. Um, sort of like literacy with um, energy, technology, media literacy so that they can sift out the misinformation. Mm. So, um, and, you know, it does start at at all levels with your, with your own kids, with um, really teachers, with early childhood people, with your colleagues. Because um, we know that if if your peers do something, and they've done studies, social studies on this, that they're more likely to do it. Right. So a bit of peer pressure to yeah. do the right thing, is yeah. it? Yeah. So mm. it's like um, now most of my friends have got solar now, or they're looking at it. Mm. A lot of my friends, when they're redoing their kitchen, have are getting induction. So, <clears throat> and my um, my practice, my practice, the practice I work at. It's uh, half the doctors got, have got EVs now um, so because they understand air pollution and vehicles and because they can afford it. Mm, mm. So, so what's the story with air pollution? Does it have any major impact on health? Abs- I mean, it seems to be we got in cleaner air now than it was. Uh, I remember as a kid, I woke up, hmm. I'd go out on the street, I could smell the petrol. Yeah. I mean, it's gone a bit better. We don't have the lead in the petrol, petrol anymore. But it's still stuff. got the other pollutants in the, in the petrol. So we okay. So what what is air pollution? So I think of air pollution as a big soup. So we've got lots of um, different particles in it. You've got the liquid particles we call the aerosol particles. Then you've got the particulate matter, which is PM two point five, two point five microns, or ten microns. Okay, that's what's floating around the soup. The sources of um, air pollution for you are depend on where you live. So if you live near a coal fired power station or some industries. Your local air pollution could be that industry. Mm. But in city, in urban areas, it's mainly motor vehicles. So what do we know about studies from motor vehicles? We know that there's there's lots of studies from the 1960s and 70s from the US where they found that people who live near heavy, like roads that were really, really, really busy had an increased risk of dementia, had an increased risk of stroke and heart disease. There's been really good studies that looked at nitrous dioxide, which is the main thing they look at from car pollution in mm. Spain. They call the Barcelona studies that looked at uh, the working memory for school aged children between the ages of seven and eleven and found that their working memories were impacted with schools that were near heavily trafficked areas. So we know that um so we've got those studies and then we've got um, studies from Australia called the Australian uh, um, Australian Car Pollution Study, which was done started in 2012 and then reviewed again like four years ago where they had universities linked to schools that were close to um, areas with car pollution and they had monitors where they, they also, again, kids from the ages of 7 to 11, where they kids had to use a peak flow meter and they had a NO2 monitor so they could actually monitor how much the kid breathed in of the nitrous dioxide and checked their lung function. And they found that it, it would increase the risk of asthma with the kids as well. And that's part of what you get from combusting on a gas cooktop is nitrous dioxide. Very similar then to yeah. what you get at the back of the car. Yep. So if we're moving from petrol cars mm-hmm. to EVs, mm-hmm. we will actually get not just the renewable benefit if those EVs yep. are powered by renewable energy, 
but you'll also get the benefit of um, less health effects on you, especially young oh, and elderly, right. is it? Yeah, that's right. Mm, that's right. That's mm, right. Mm. What uh, about bushfires and things which we now mm. get more? Does that affect the unborn or, yeah, or people? So there's um, with the bushfires, with the black summer that we had, there is an ongoing study regarding mothers who are breathing in the smoke during their pregnancy. Mm. And um, we know that the more people died after the bushfires than actually during the bushfires from the air pollution from the bushfires. Um, so, I mean, how do you do that? Let's say it's an elderly person. There's 89. Mm-hmm. Maybe all that smoke was just the last thing that pushed them over the edge. Mm, uh, yeah. But, I mean, the doctor is not going to say bushfire victim and they'll just say died of old age. So how do you pick this yeah. stuff? So you look at the excess deaths if the bushfires weren't there. Ah, so you say in a city of one million people, mm. every day, theoretically, a thousand people would die. I'm just making it mm. up. Mm-hmm. And then a month after the bushfire, suddenly we had 2,000, is mm. it? Is that yeah. how you so, do it? Yeah, that, that's how, not how the epidemiologist right. who did the study, not me. Right, <laughs> okay? right, got it. I'm translating the science. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's not really a nice job there to count the dead, but uh, I suppose it does give you information about our health, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Right, right. And so so there's really so, an impact on bushfires, yeah. is it? And so if you actually even look at pregnancy, that we know that um, if a woman is um, in a prolonged heat wave during pregnancy, it actually alters the growth of the baby and we get premature um, premature labour from mm. heat waves. Mm. So mm. there's more studies going on heat waves in Western Australia and in India at the moment to see how heat waves actually impact on pregnancies more specifically. But we know from the the information we have already that putting a woman in a hot place for a long time during during a heat wave is not a safe thing to do. So it's yeah. So we've got the we've got enough information from health already to know that we need greater and faster action for the transition. Mm-hmm. But look, I mean. I'm going to get very fundamental here now, Mm -hmm. but our society is a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. I worked for a big multinational Mm -hmm. and every staff meeting and every sales meeting, Mm -hmm. it was all about growing the pie, selling more product, Mm. not really the responsibility what happens after the product, just build the Mm. product and send it out. And then after that, we were wiped by hands, no responsibility. Mm. Now, every product we generate has a CO2 footprint. Mm. We have now made the world a much more connected world. So instead of being made locally, I mean, a bottle of water, Perrier water or whatever, Mm. comes all the way from France. Mm. The amount of CO2 that's sitting right next to that bottle, when I could have a local produced water bottle, is unbelievable. So our whole society every day is actually fueling the fire of CO2. Mm. And then we're kind of thinking a few little technologies like solar and EVs can change it. When actually from a fundamental aspect, the Mm. way that we run our lives, 90% of us actually contributing with all good intention Mm. to the problem. Yeah, I think you know what we all do. And you know what actually made me understand why globalisation was as difficult with COVID. COVID actually showed how having a global connected community with each country specialising in one thing was a problem. Because if you looked at where masks were made. Masks, uh, chocolate bars? No, masks for face. Ah, face masks. Right, face masks. Oh, mm. um, it was in China. And if you look at even just specifically at the glass vials that a lot of medications come in, mm. they're from India. Mm. And um, and so you saw the disruption in global this global supply chain with really common drugs as well because of COVID. So... It showed us the disadvantage of actually not, in man, not ma- manufacturing things in Australia. Um, I mean, we had companies like Resmed that make um, CPAP, um, sleep apnea products, make respirators. Mm. Um, so we, it's, you know, it's, what's happened is that that's what capitalism has done is that it's made things cheaper because you have different countries subspecializing certain things so things could be made more cheaply on mm. a mass scale in one country. Because there's a theory that if you double the production mm. numbers, you yep. can take 20% of and the cost. The tr- I know, but the trouble is when you have a global pandemic and it causes everything to freeze, you see the major holes in your system. 
from a health point of view, it was a major hole only because things like, okay, I think like a stylus, which was what um, a few of my patients used for menopause, mm. the supply of that got disrupted because it was made in the US. Mm. Mm. And so, and that disrupted the lives of a core part of my patients. So it's looking at how we can, I mean, how do we actually look at reducing emissions? If we could actually create energy, if you look at it from the energy point of view, if we get every solar, or every house having a solar system, then you have, and battery technology is improving. So we're not always going to be relying on lithium. There's cheaper things that can be made. Batteries can be more effectively, more efficiently made. And each community had their hub of energy storage where some communities might be able to have off-river hydro mm. for their storage. So each community could have their own energy. It makes the supply <coughs> safer. If you look at, because if you look at the national electricity grid, if something happens, you get the whole of the eastern states impacted. But if you had communities with their own energy hubs, you have more secure, secure energy. And then the money doesn't flow overseas to interna- multinational companies where it happens now with gas mm. and so many other things <coughs> so that you keep the energy production to the people who utilise the energy. And if even if you look at food systems, if you can make – if you can encourage local large community gardens, people to grow their own food, then people can have access to fresh food. Um, but you know, in, in some way what you're really saying is the future is going back to the past because I believe mm. uh, mm. decentralised energy was the way that in the mm. past local government actually in the early days ran the energy supply mm. and mm. then it all got uh, gobbled up and bigger and bigger companies, but mm. we're now in positions where we have many, many monopolies. Where in the past there used to be mm. five, six local companies making soft drinks. We still got many brands, but it's all owned by a couple of mm. big companies. And soft drink might be not the right example, but in a lot of cases it's been monopolized and our choices are not there. Mm. But if you say like a big country like Australia, if we suddenly need to manufacture most of the little things here and there, mm. I just don't think it's realistic and feasible because we we will not be cost efficient and cost effective. And unfortunately, a lot of people talk the talk, mm. but when they're sitting there on the supermarket shelf and one thing is locally made and it's 14 bucks and the other one is coming from far, far away at seven bucks, and they look very similar, guess what? Mm. So the, the systems aren't in place for all of us to make the right choice. We're, we're kind of going into a card game mm. where the cards are actually already predetermined, even mm. so we're naively thinking mm. we've still got to playing a game. So it's it's communities actually, you know, you know if the, the less resources you have, the less choices you have. And that's the, where the system mm. is. Mm. Mm. So that a, a small group of people can make the choices that are going to help with the transition, but it's not to make people who don't can't make the choices guilty about it because they don't. Can't, they, we can't change the system because the t- system needs to be changed, but it will take time. So, yes, Marcus, it is it is a conundrum, isn't it? It is a conundrum. It's, Look. I think with most of these big things, I have a very simple saying is how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> Small piece by piece. Uh, an elephant's probably not the right choice. <laughs> well, I, I, we, 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 let's, okay, we're not eating elephants here, but how do you eat something that is really big? Yeah. Like a big problem. If you cut it into small bite-sized mm. pieces, yep. at that point in time, um, you you are able to fix it a bit more. So maybe we have to go back to the things mm. that we started off, which is your own house. Uh, which you made energy efficient with twenty one dollars thirty three as your electricity bill per month. Oh, I no, still remember 64, that sixty four oh, for three months, months, which is twenty one thirty three oh, okay. oh, per, per month. month. Yep. Yes, yep. done my math there. Yep. And maybe people just have to look at their own little plays. How can we make it more energy efficient? How can we get our electricity bill down? How we can we make our transport more uh, economic? Um, an EV is a better option from even an air pollution point of view. And how can we use our local influence to get the councillors to get the shovels out and give us trees in our local streets? Maybe just some little successes like that encourages us to tackle the big things, such as uh, all the sugar aisles in our supermarket, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, Marcus. 
I agree with you. So you've been talking about growing your own vegetables too, and and what did you call a, a forest, a, a, a fruit garden forest, or what did oh, you call yeah, it? Oh, it's called a food forest. A food forest. forest wow, yeah. wow. What you 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 hang little bananas off the trees, <laughs> or what? What is it? So what I've got is I've got um a, one of the core of it's also my eight chickens that I've got. So they're my waste eaters, and they produce eggs. Um, you and, haven't got roosters and angry no, neighbours, do you? Oh, no, roosters are illegal in ah. most electorates. Ah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, so most um, non-sort of agricultural areas, roosters are illegal. So, but, but chickens are okay. Chickens are okay. Mm, um, mm. And so, yep, so I've got maybe 20 fruit trees mm. um, around um, my garden. So I've kind of chosen them to basically fruit at different times of the year. And um and so I've got like uh, I've got tangelos, uh, lemon, imperial mandarin, kumquat, peach, nectarine, mango, mulberry, blueberry, uh, and I've got a very large grapevine that wraps around the bagola around my backyard, so it shades the chicken house. Um, and so then I've actually mulched my backyard as well. So I put Chinese greens and different lettuces actually in the ground. And I've got um, two wicking beds. So wicking beds are the most uh, water efficient way to actually um, water your garden. So what happens is that um, they're purpose built so they've got rocks at the bottom and piping um, and then soil on top. And there's a, a, where you water is actually through a through a, a pipe on top and it goes down to the system and capillary, capillary feeds up to the plants. Capillary, is it? Ca- capillary like, feeds up yeah, to the yeah. plants. And so, yeah, so I've got those beds as well. What do you plant on the top? Um, at the moment I've got chilies and lettuces and uh, beans. So you actually go to your garden to cut the food and then you take it in and eat it, is yes, it? Yes, I do, yeah. Wow. I don't think many people in Sydney have time for that. Yeah, it's my major hobby and it's my love. So mm. I make the time for it. Mm. But I'm going to say a lot because I actually encourage patients to grow their own herbs if they can. Even if they're renting, you can grow it in any sort of container. Um, Just for a bit of mental health of seeing something yeah. succeed yeah. and you're, so you have you're to, in control. Yeah, and that's then, right. Yeah, okay. Because to start gardening somewhere, herbs are expensive to buy. Mm. And a lot of my patients have got chickens now. So that they can, because, you know, food waste is such a big problem. Chooks will eat almost everything. Right. And then provide you with fresh eggs. Mm. And, like, it's actually good for the mental health, your mental health to have chooks. So it's starting. Do you give yours name? So eight you got? Yeah, okay. I've only named the ones I can separate out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so three of them have got names. The other five look very similar. <laughs> <laughs> five Johns and oh, Johnny, uh, well, lady uh, names. But uh, yeah, okay, got yeah, it. No, I got mm. Harriet, Thilma and Louise. Mm. And um, yeah, no, my daughter's named a lot of the other chickens in the past because we've got Maggie Noob. Maggie Noodles and Eggy Azalea and <laughs> mm, mm. now sad question, but how long do chicken last? I mean, how do what's their lifespan? So it depends. Like, um, if I've had an eight year old chicken, um, so it depends on their life, mm. and um, in a way, I suppose how cared for they are. Um, you look at it's about four to five years with most chickens. Mm, mm. Yeah. So then they just die of old age, do they? Yeah, yeah. Although unfortunately, I've had two lots of chickens eaten by foxes. Um, so mm. now my I've got a twenty six square meter chicken house, and they're never allowed out. Right, right. Yeah. Wow, you got foxes in Borkham Hills, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Although, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would be a little bit sad there when coming in the morning and seeing somebody had lunch. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, but the, do you get enough eggs to actually give them away now? Because it, uh, my grandmother had so many eggs, we yeah. could never eat them all. Yeah, no, I, I uh, do a trade because both my neighbours actually grow food. So I ah. do a trade with my neighbours ah. um, and across the road and I take eggs to work. So I do get about eight, eight eggs a day. So, yeah, yeah, you couldn't eat them by no, yourself. No. You'd go yeah. popping out of eggs. Yeah, yeah so okay. it, is, it is good for trade and goodwill. <laughs> okay. And do you have to give them a bit of extra food too? Like, I mean, yes, you got your leftovers mm. and your greens and bits and pieces that you cut off the carrot ends mm. and all that, and I bet that's all quite good. But mm. 
Is that enough or do you have to give them oh, a bit I of supplementary? So, yeah, so they, they do get a layer food as well. But I do cut off leaves and whenever I cut off anything, trim anything, I chuck it into the chook house. Mm. I'm mowing the lawn, I chuck it in the chook house. What, you're saying they eat lawn clippings? Yeah, they eat lawn clippings, yeah. Oh, my God. I get a whole bins full I don't know what to do with. <laughs> you <laughs> must save a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you must. <laughs> Gee. Look, there's, I mean, I love talking to you because there's actually stuff I'm learning now. Yeah. And in my neighbourhood where somebody does have chicken. Yeah. They don't keep them uh, controlled. Uh, I actually walk out in the morning, bring my bin in, and there's two chickens just running up and down the road. They kind of have taken the whole neighbourhood over now. So we do actually in the suburbs now are getting a few more chickens. Yeah. Um, But a couple of years ago, my son actually brought two little baby chicken home from childcare where they had, um, you know, seen how they put the eggs in, put them in the breeding, see how they pop out. And we got two home to have chickens and both of them were roosters. Oh. And within about five months, yeah. the council came past because the neighbours were getting pretty annoyed yeah. with the four o'clock yeah. rooster calls. Yeah. And now that you're telling me they are illegal, now I get it. Um, <laughs> and uh, But then what do you do? They looked beautiful. Yeah. I got two roosters here. Now what do I do with them? And luckily I rang my council and there's a farm in Western Sydney called Carmsley Hill at City Farm. Yeah. And my brother-in-law also took two home from the child, same childcare centre and both of them were roosters too. Yeah. And guess what? Mm-hmm. On the same Saturday, we both met each other at the gate of the farm to drop off the roosters. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not planned. <laughs> but the neighbourhood had really organised themselves against us <laughs> for those roosters. So if you do get them, make sure they're chicken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I really appreciate it. Lots of information, lots of ways how to live more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, some people probably think, oh, this is all, you know, going back in the hippie days. But the truth is our society as humans have survived in a fairly minimalistic lifestyle for millions of years. Mm. And the luxury and the comfort we have nowadays is relatively a blip in history. And if we're not careful and simplify our lives a little bit, mm. It might have only been a blip in history because future generations won't be able to afford the waste that we're currently creating mm. with the systems we have. Oh, yeah. The waste is a huge problem, actually. It's probably, the, in a way, it's a major problem. Because yeah. we're not really pulling the resources out of no. it that is going in in the first no, place. No. All right. Look, uh, we're not going to solve every problem today. <laughs> But uh, hopefully people who listen, it gives them a little bit of inspiration that as an individual, because that's all you are, you're now as a doctor, you're advising people, you've been on going on committees, you're influencing local government, you're living your talk. Um, it's quite impressive. And other people can just follow in your for shoes. Yep. All Thanks. right. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Want more Energy Answered? Visit yourenergyanswers.com for quality energy products tools and calculators and find your quality local installers. Please support the channel by liking the video, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and check out all our other videos. You're still here? I'll see you next time. Bye.